G'day everyone, I'm the man called Kim Osabi, the man with the plan from the land down under, and this is my review of Relentless Tin Soldier by Nicholas Greer and Seeker Murti. I backed a digital copy of the book. I liked the classic cover homage and the old school, almost golden age costume of the protagonist. It wouldn't look out of place in the original Justice Society. This book is mostly the origin story of the Relentless Tin Soldier. We meet him in his alter ego, a rookie cop named Ben Pearson, who is looking into the distribution of a new drug called Mist in his off hours. His sergeant warns him off this course of action, but Ben is determined to stop the flow of mist into the city and prove that Marco Coletta is the one behind it. In the next scene, Coletta bribes a clerk for a copy of Ben's personnel report. He's already aware of the young policeman's action, and this foreshadows danger for the protagonist. The two policemen see a homeless man ODing on mist. When they run to help them, they are attacked. Thugs attempt to drive by shooting. The sergeant's hit, but Ben nails one of the bad guys right in the dome. I was expecting Golden Age flavour, not drug ODs and headshots. It was jarring, but not in a bad way. It was a wake-up call to the reader. Shit gets real. Sarge pulls through in the hospital and Coletta is furious that the hit went awry. He puts in a call to a real-life supervillain to do the job, but we don't know that yet. There is an explosion at the police department and a toy soldier emerges unscathed from the flames. It belongs to Geppetto, a toy-themed villain in the vein of Toy Man and even Puppet Master. This is a nice nod to the outlandish supervillains of the past, a convention of classic comic books that I really miss. Ben gets a call to head into work, it's all hands on deck after the explosion, and on his way out he gets clubbed and abducted. The Sarge notices Ben is uncharacteristically missing from the assembly, and has dispatch ping his phone for his location. The juxtaposition of modern tech with an old school toy themed villain worked really well. It highlights exactly how insane someone would have to be to go all in on a toy theme and commit crimes. Ben wakes up in a costume hooked up to a high tech machine. Geppetto admits he plans to experiment on Ben and turn him into a living toy. He starts the process which infuses him with a green serum. The police show up and Geppetto injects himself with a syringe of the same serum, transforming into a giant green ape that tears through the police. As Tin Soldier, Ben easily subdues the ape with his newfound superhuman strength. We cut to a scene in a hospital. Ben gets his checkup and is determined to be completely healthy. He says he can activate his new metal skin ability at will. With only the SWAT team, the Sarge and the police chief aware of what happened in Geppetto's workshop, Ben is asked to take on the mantle of the Tin Soldier and be the hero that the world needs him to be. With that, issue one ends. As I've said, there's a lot here that I like. I like the Tin Soldier, his relentless moniker, his costume and power set. I like Geppetto as a character and hope Nicholas Greer has something planned for him. And I like the Golden Age feel mixed with modern technology. There's a lot of potential with this book as it grows. Nicholas could do that city out of time type thing that Batman the Animated Series did so well. For some reason, this part of the US is almost stuck in a time warp. It's kept up with technology but has old fashioned sensibilities. Nicholas could build up an entire team of Golden Age heroes and their various nemeses and rogues galleries all within this one old-fashioned city. The digital copy of the book that I received had the Billy Tucci cover, and it's great to see some of the big names are still happy to help out up-and-coming creators. A new creator's money is just as green as one of your ex-pro peers, so if you have the time, why not draw a cover for them? The colouring on this book is vibrant, with impactful colours that pop. Combined with the very clean line work of C. Kamuti, it gives the book a very wholesome, clean and neat feel, lending to a more professional aspect, as well as enhancing the story itself. If you tell a story with Golden Age sensibilities and colour it muddy and grimy, you're making a statement. By telling a modern story with colours this bold, you're also saying something about the world the characters live in. The world of Watchmen was drab and dreary because it was coloured that way, and it reflected how mundane the heroes actually were. The bright colours of Tin Soldier speak of hope, of eventual victory, and with comics the way they are today, still reeling from Alan Moore's legacy, that's a welcome feeling. As good as the potential for this book is, so too is the potential of the opportunities missed. Now I have to mention that some of these criticisms come from the format we're all beholden to. Many CG and indie comic creators still write as if they were creating monthly titles, 22 to 30 pages, paced and structured like the reader is going to get the next issue in 30 days. But they're not. If they're lucky, they'll get the next issue in 6 to 12 months. Indie creators don't have the resources of the big two, or even the next five big publishers. We're doing this with whatever money is left over at the end of the month. There might need to be a shift towards creating self-contained stories that have a beginning, middle and end, and wrap up a given storyline while maintaining a number of B, C and even D plot lines. I think the Cayman America crew does this well, but they're also working with a much larger page count than the creators who are making what is essentially bespoke floppies twice a year. I noticed, as I do, a lack of an editor credit on this book. I feel like a broken record. There is an extensive thanks section. Maybe these guys acted as beta readers. Maybe they brought to Nicholas's attention some of the things I'll mention in a minute. And maybe Nick just had to let them slide because, again, we're all doing this with limited resources. I don't know the situation here. 
But also remember, your work is not you. Your value as a person does not hinge on the value of your work, no matter what the world or the internet tells you. There are some wonderful people that aren't especially good at telling stories, and there are some atrocious human beings that are masterful storytellers. There are some narrator boxes throughout the book that I just drop altogether. Greer does a great job of giving us information via dialogue, something that I feel like is a lost art in comics these days. The narrator boxes were superfluous. Greer needs to be confident in his strong ability to tell a story and not couch details in these boxes. They force their way into the narrative and give us information we have already gleaned from character interaction. Greer got the whole point of dialogue and backstory right, which is not very common these days, then goes and gums up the works by adding extra narrative boxes. There are little now-slash-earlier-in-the-day boxes to orient the reader at the start of the book. The first scene is Ben and the Sarge talking about the new drug. Then we jump back in time earlier in the day to see Coletta organising a hit on Ben. Then we jump forward to when we see the hobo ODing. It would have been better to start with a super CD back alley exchange of money and information, highlighting that Ben is in danger, then moving forward in time to him and Sarge talking, then seeing the hobo OD and them getting shot at. Done the way it is in the comic, it leads to some clumsy transitions and unnecessary jumping around between scenes and time of the day. Again, Greer has the ingredients for success here, but mixes them in an order that's less than intuitive. And that comes with experience, though, and consistent feedback. I'm sure Tin Soldier No. 2 will be smoother and even more professional than the first book. There's some good stuff happening with the art, some real Finchian detail going on. Sometimes the perspective is a little off on vehicles and rooms, but I believe this artist will continue to grow as they continue to work. Characters are easily identifiable, and you're never unsure as to where they are. It's a little thing, but the objects placed in the background, paintings, sculptures, bookcases, feel very deliberate and make the world seem more real and fleshed out. I'd like to see some more line variation in the art. It feels like everything was drawn with the same size of brush, I'm assuming this was drawn digitally. And it makes depth and backgrounds too busy, interfering with what's happening in the foreground. Line thickness matters. Inkers matter. There are definitely some places where the transitions could be smoother. This sort of thing is limited by page real estate. And in some cases, it might be better to drop an element altogether than to force it into a space too small for what it is. Here we see Ben getting a call telling him the station has been attacked and that he has to go into work. He asks if anyone's been hurt, then we get a panel of the phone hung up with no answer. Is it a call from the police? Is it from the bad guys pretending to be the police to get him to leave his apartment so they can abduct him? I think it would have been better here to have Ben say, I'll be right there, see him hanging up the phone, and then see him getting dressed. The whole thing would flow better. It might not seem like a big deal to you watching this review, but this sort of thing is a speed bump. It pulls you out of the story for a second, maybe more. Comics are entertainment and escapism. You don't want your audience to lose that sense of being there, experiencing the story. You don't want them stopping and asking themselves, hey, what happened here? You want everything in your book to be as smooth as possible. Then again, on a limited budget of money, time and page real estate, a new creator might not have the resources to deal with the clumsy transition and decide to just roll with it and do better next time. It's all we can ask of them and all they can ask of themselves. My biggest gripe with the book is the lack of development of Ben as a character. What's his motivation? Why does he do what he does? Why did he become a cop? Why does he have such a burning desire to know the truth and see justice done? He's enthusiastic and headstrong, but he's largely a blank slate. I'd like to have seen a little more time spent on who he is and why he does what he does. I'm not a huge fan of most of their movies, but the Pixar way of telling stories is satisfying and reliable. Elements from the past inform the present. A physical victory should be bolstered by a moral or personal victory. Woody didn't return to his lofty position as Andy's favourite toy. He won by learning to share the spot with Buzz and gained a new friend along the way. Lightning McQueen didn't get sufficient upgrades in performance to win the race in the third Cars movie. He won by becoming a trainer to help the next generation of racers succeed. If there was some mention of Ben's past, his father was a cop who ran away from a dangerous situation or died saving others. And that tragedy motivated Ben today, giving him the strength to fight on to be the hero his father was or to overcome the reputation for cowardice his father left with him. That'd work. It could be that the mist was going to kill or brainwash Ben, but for his personal demons it motivated him to overcome the drug's effects and channel it into manifesting his new powers. In this issue, a lot of stuff just sort of happens to Ben. We know nothing of his past, friends, family or motivations. If he has no friends or family, make that a storytelling point like Cap's sad, sad bachelor life and winter soldier. What does America's greatest champion of democracy have to go home to when he completes a dangerous mission? An empty mid-level apartment. No wonder he went rogue to save Bucky. Bucky is part of his past, the only part he still has. Bucky is more home to him than the apartment. That's Cap's motivation, a man out of time desperately seeking a handhold in the present. If Greer can get some of that storytelling grit into his otherwise great book, he'll do amazing things in the future.